First of all, thanks to Liz Randall and the Ole Miss Women's Council. My love, Mary, was the chairman of the council for a couple of years in the past, past couple of years. And I know firsthand the good works that they do. And Liz, you are remarkable. And I'm so honored to be a part of this, this speaker's forum dealing with Angela Duckworth's book, Grit. It's a New York Times bestseller. And she says that grit is the power that comes from passion and perseverance meeting at the crossroads. Well, I happen to believe in that too. And as I flipped through this book, it made me ask myself the question that probably many of you have asked all through the years. What is grit? Well, we're told she has grit or he has grit. They performed with great grit, or they couldn't have done that without some kind of grit. Well, I look at grit as finding your own personal power. And what is power and how do we find it? Power comes in two different ways. First, your primary power, which is your integrity and your character. And then your secondary power, your learned skills, and how you execute those learned skills. Truly powerful people have both, but some people can succeed fairly well with only one. You might find yourself saying, how could that jerk be so successful? Well, that jerk has well-defined secondary power, but imagine what he could do if he had primary power, character and integrity to go along with the other talents. He could do anything. I spent the first part of my life being told by my mother that I was special every day of my life. And because of that, I always felt special. And I can remember thinking to myself, this is a really difficult situation. And if I'm special, shouldn't I be able to get through it? I got my first B in school in the fourth grade. I was nine years old. I came home crying to my mother. How could Mrs. Camp give me a B? I'm supposed to be special. I've never made a B. She said, well, you're going to have to have the courage to go in and ask her about it. No, no, mom, you, you go, you go. You tell her Sam's never made a B and, and you go tell her that you need to give him a B. She said, I'm not going to do it. And as I was reading this book, <laughs> I thought that little nine-year-old guy had to have grit. But I went in and met with Mrs. Camp and we turned that B into an A. <laughs> because I was able to prove to her that every grade I had been given from her all that semester in the fourth grade had been an A. And she changed it. And I learned something very important that then followed up in 1964. So go with me, if you will, to the fourth grade in Amory, Mississippi in 1964. I was nine years old. Every Monday, I would rush as fast as I could to get to the corner drugstore on Main Street of Amory to get my photo play magazine. Now to the older members of the crowd, the photo play magazine was the precursor to what you have now in People magazine. And in photo play magazine were all the stories of all the stars and the TV shows and the movies. And there was never any time at all that I could not tell you what the number one shows were on television, what you should be watching, what you should not be watching, which movies would win the Oscars, which songs would win the Grammys. And in 1964, I predicted and was correct that the Beatles would be the best new artists at the Grammys, that Julie Andrews would win the Oscar for Mary Poppins, which was my favorite show that year, favorite movie that year, and that Bonanza, which was my favorite television show, would be the number one show on the air on NBC. And it was, and they all came true. I would go down the streets of Amory, Mississippi with my photo play magazine. And I would say, when I grow up, I'm going to Hollywood. And I'm sure all who heard it, all who I passed would say, bless his heart. 
But my mother said he can do anything he wants to do because he's special. And I had that belief indoctrinated into me as a little guy. So when I was watching Bonanza one night and I saw this commercial about this man named the cheer man who was going from town to town and house to house knocking on doors. And when the lady of the house or the man of the house would answer the door, he would say, do you use cheer detergent? And they would say, why, yes, I do. And he said, well, here's $10. Well, I was absolutely certain that the cheer man was going to come to Amory, Mississippi. But more importantly, to 405 South 3rd Street in Amory, Mississippi, which was my childhood home. So I wasn't content that my mother used cheer. I wasn't content that there was a box of cheer ready the moment he arrived. So I went down to the local print shop and I bought giant poster board and paints and glitter and colored rocks. And I made the cheer logo because he had to see my house when he drove by. And so we put it out front and attached it to two of the front columns on the house in Amory, Mississippi, and we waited. My father and his golf buddies would come in on Saturday making fun of me and the cheer sign. Hey, Sammy. I was Sammy then. My grandfather was Big Sam. My father was Little Sam. And I was Sammy. I changed that in the ninth grade, but that's another story for another time. Hey, Sammy, he would say, when's the cheer man coming? <laughs> My mother would stick up for me and say, if he believes the cheer man's coming, then the cheer man's coming. And I waited through rainstorms and the paint was starting to fade and dribble down. And that cheer sign went from the front yard and columns to under my bed, to into my closet. And Labor Day of 1965, almost a year later, it was my middle brother, Jamie's birthday. And on any of the Haskell boys' birthdays, my father was always grilling hamburgers. My mother was in the kitchen working on dinner and the cake. We were out front playing football. And suddenly I hear down Third Street, cheer, cheer, cheer is here, cheer. And we all ran down to the curb and looked down Third Street and the little cheer car was coming up Third Street. Well, I knew he had to be coming for me. Why would he stop at anyone else's house? So I ran in to get my faded cheer sign. People were ripping my mother's cheer box apart to have a, a, a piece of it to show. And I proudly walked out with my cheer sign and he pulled up to the curb. You get the $10. My father is apoplectic. <laughs> How is this possible? This kid has been talking about you for over a year. How is it possible that you're down here in this little tiny town? The commercial's not even on the air anymore. Well, sir, you see, there's this thing called a computer. Now in 1965, a computer was the size of a refrigerator. It's nothing like what we carry around in our pockets now. It was the size of a refrigerator with lots of blinking lights, looked like something from a sci-fi movie. And into that computer, the chairman said, we put every address of every registered voter in every county in every state in the United States. And 405 South Third Street was the address in Monroe County, Mississippi that kicked out. And that's why I'm here today. So you see, I learned a valuable lesson. And in comparing it to Angela Duckworth's book on grit, I had to have grit to stand up to my father, to my friends, and to the people in town who thought the little guy was crazy, telling everybody the cheer man was coming. And the cheer man came. He really came. And when I sold my book back in 2009, Promises I Made My Mother, it was that story, that story of the cheer man that got me five offers from five different publishers to buy that book. It was that story. Because you see, that story set me on a path. It set me on a path of believing that if I worked hard and believed in something with enough passion and I could persevere in that passion, that I could make anything happen. Now, if the cheer man hadn't come, I would have just changed the dream to something else. Because you see, when you, when you build a life on dreams, you have to be willing to sway and turn and curve because everything doesn't happen 
exactly the way you planned. Anyone who tells you that everything has worked out perfectly in their lives is lying. Because you see, we all, we all have tests and challenges, but it's how we deal with those tests and challenges that ultimately defines who we are. And I'm proud to say that nothing will deter me from dreaming. I dreamed of, of finding a woman like Mary Haskell. And that dream came true some 40 something years ago. And it's been the strength and the heart and the soul of everything the Haskell family does and will do because of her. And I, I just, I can't, I can't say enough about that. And seeing her involved with an organization like the Women's Council makes me so proud. You know, our dear friend and my business partner, Dolly Parton, will be coming to Oxford September 25th and 26th, is that right, Lon? To be given the 20th anniversary Ole Miss Women's Council Legacy Award. And she is so thrilled. And she asked me to tell you all hello and thank you. And she can't wait to come to Oxford. And I think Elizabeth High School, who's sitting right over here, will be preparing a, a meal for her. And she's most excited because I told her she was going to have a personal meal prepared by the Today Show food consultant who just happens to be one of our neighbors. No, she said. I said, yes, yes, indeed. So she will be here in the fall and, and we will have a, a really special time with the Ole Miss Women's Council. Think about that word grit. What does that word mean in your normal daily life? Grit can be facing, facing change. What is change? Change is something that happens to all of us and we either accept it or reject it. But I believe we have to accept it because there's no sense fighting change. So what does change cause? Frustration, angst, disorganization. But change can also be something that creates exhilaration and something new and something wonderful to explore. I believe in change. And I want there to be change in my life. Every day, I want to be challenged and look at change as something, something wonderful. Grit can also be replacing the unforgiving minute. Now, listen to me on this. Replacing the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. How often do we stay mired down and being angry at something or some situation? But if you replace it with that same minute of something positive, it will all work out. Grit could also be defined in the opening of Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. It takes grit to get through something like that. It takes grit. It takes grit to face triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. You can't allow yourself to get too high or too low in your daily walk. You must be able to face triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Grit is an athlete who gives 150% to get the ball across the final line in the last 30 seconds of a football game. Grit to me is John Reese Plumley. What an athlete this young man is. He can pass the ball and he can swing the bat. And I understand that as of yesterday, Ole Miss is number one. And I look at John Reese Plumley as this incredible example of grit. If I ever meet him, I'll tell him that. But I love watching him play ball. I love to see how he never gives up. And that's ultimately what we have to do. Now, I want to go back to 1965. I was in the fifth grade at Amory Middle School. And I had had this experience with the cheer man the year before. And I was at the all school awards day program at Amory Middle School. And I saw them announce the top boy and girl of the year from the eighth grade. And they were called the Good Citizenship Award winners. Well, I went home to my mother and I said, when I'm in the eighth grade, 
I'm going to win the Good Citizenship Award. Calm down, Sam, Sammy, calm down. <laughs> in order to win the Good Citizenship war Award and be the outstanding boy in the eighth grade, you have to really be a good citizen. Well, well what does that mean, Mama? Well, you'll figure it out. So I played sports. I would help the coaches clean up, you know, after everything was done. I went to the First Baptist Church three times a week. I would, you know, help clean the, the chalkboards from all the erasers and bang those erasers together to get the chalk out of the erasers. I worked hard in Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout by the time I was 13. And at the beginning of my eighth grade year, it was all starting to come to fruition. Now, I started taking piano in the fifth grade, and I was really getting quite good. In fact, the summer between the seventh and eighth grade, my teacher would take me to all these piano competitions, and I was winning gold medals at college competitions as a 12-year-old turning 13 going into the eighth grade. So, I mean, I would get up in the mornings in my eighth grade year and just look in the mirror and go, yes. You know, I was all that. I was it. I was my full height at age 13. I thought I was it. So I had to decide how I was going to cinch that Good Citizenship Award. I had to have some grit. So I decided I was going to run for president of the student body. If I could be president of the student body in the eighth grade, that would cinch the award because I would be known as the leader of the school. Now, you can only imagine with the attitude that I had at 13, I might not have been as popular as you think, but I was smart. So I went down to the fifth and sixth grade where I had some cousins and I gave them some pamphlets to pass out with a sucker attached. I won in a landslide. Fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade all voted, and I won in a landslide. I thought, I've got this, I've got this. Spring comes around, and the all school talent show is announced. Now, at that particular time, the head coach of the varsity football team came down to look at the middle school football team to choose four eighth graders who would come and work out with the high school team during spring practice. You figured it out already, I know. I was one of the four boys. So I thought, this is great. But then they announced the all-school talent show. And because I just won Superior playing the piano at one of these festivals, at that time it was MSCW, Mississippi State College for Women, now it's MUW. But I had won this piano festival and they wanted me to close the show. So I had to go to my coach because you see the talent show was during one of those spring football practices. So after a long debate, he finally agreed to let me go early. Well, the day of the talent show, I'm on the football field and I see my mother at the sideline doing this. And I go, coach, what time is it? Hurry. So I ran into the locker room, ripped off my pads, put on my little suit, jumped in the front of my mother's car. She didn't stop at a single stop sign. She was swirling around every corner, every curb to get me to the middle school. She pulled up and back. I ran down the hall, went up to the back of the auditorium where the stage was and my piano teacher was waiting for me. I told you, I told you football and piano don't mix. If you don't get out there and tear this piece up, I'm not gonna teach you anymore. I told you, I warned you. And I went, and I thought back to breakfast that morning. My mother said, honey, you think you need to take your music for the talent show? I said, mother, I won the superior medal at the MSCW, you know, piano contest. No, I don't need my music. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the MSCW Piano Festival, Sammy Haskell. Walk out on the stage, big applause. And I was there just two minutes before I went on. I didn't even hear the rest of the talents. I sit down at the bench. And as my teacher had always told me, you take a breath, hands in your lap, think about the first chord and go. Well, 
This was a very difficult piece. And I used 10 fingers on every chord in the piece and was all over the keyboard. So I sat down, took that breath, and then dun da 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 da. Crickets are chirping. And I thought, what's wrong? I, I, I couldn't remember where, I couldn't remember. I thought, oh, well, this is this not happening. I, I heard a little snicker in the audience, Mr. Oh, Mr. Perfect, you know. So I put my hands back in, the, in my lap, breathe in, da, 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 da. and there's nothing there nothing and i banged those piano keys like a spoiled brat ran off the stage straight to the parking lot and threw myself on the hood of my mother's car and cried like the big old baby i was i was acting like and my mother was out there oh honey honey it happens to everybody it's okay it's okay it don't worry about it don't worry about it and the piano teacher i told you i warned you about piano and football they don't mix they don't mix and suddenly I raise up off of the hood of the car and I go, oh my gosh, I got to go back inside and apologize. What if this affects the Good Citizenship Award? So I went back and tried to find every single teacher involved in the talent show, the principal who loved me. Of course, we forgive you. Of course, we forgive you. Two weeks later was the all school awards day. I thought everything was fine. I knew from past winners that the parents were called the week before the awards so that they could make arrangements to actually be in the auditorium to see little Susie or little Johnny win their award. I come home from school on Monday and I say, well, mama, did Dr. Morris call? Did I win the Good Citizenship Award? No, honey, they, they haven't called. Tuesday. No, honey, they haven't called. Wednesday was the same response. On Thursday, I'm beginning to get very nervous. And then I thought to myself, oh, I know what she's doing. I know what she's doing. She's going to let me be surprised. So I went home from school on that Thursday afternoon. And I said, Mama, I know what you're doing. You want me to be surprised. Just tell me that I won the award and I'll be so surprised. They'll never figure out that you told me. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> they haven't called. On Friday, because I was president of the student body, I knew I was going to have to make the final speech of the, of the awards day and wish everybody a good summer and off to summer and eighth graders to high school. So I went to the principal's office and he wasn't there. I was just going to ask him. He really liked me, you know. He wasn't there. Then I thought, well, I guess I better go to the boys' room and get myself ready for this awards day program. And as I was walking down the hall to the boys' room, I saw the parents of my best friend, <laughs> Randy Hollis, walking, sneaking into the back of the school. And I went up to them. I mean, we were at each other's homes every week, and I had told them I was going to win the award. And I said, Randy has won the Good Citizenship Award, hasn't he? And his mother hugged me and said, yes, honey, I'm so sorry. And I went in the bathroom, composed myself, and came out. And after he had won, and I was invited up to talk to the crowd, and dismiss the school for the summer. I remembered a poem my mother had taught me when I was a little guy, something that she had learned when she was in Sunday school as a, as a little girl. It went something like this. If I should win, let it be by the code with my faith and my honor held high. But if I should lose, let me be the first to stand by the road and cheer as the winner walks by. And I went straight to the room of my favorite teacher, Dr. Mike Justice, who was my biology teacher. I knew he was on the committee that chose the Good Citizenship Award. And I said, Dr. Justice, I mean, I thought of him as like a superhero. Why didn't I win 
the Good Citizenship Award. And he said, Sam, he called me Sam before I declared I was Sam. Sam, sit down. You lost by one vote. But why? Clearly, I haven't gotten over it. Um, but why? <laughs> and he said, because there were two teachers that debated for over an hour about your un-citizenship-like behavior when you slammed those piano keys in the talent show, and they just couldn't see themselves clear to give it to you. I promise most of this is sweat. I promise. <laughs> and they just couldn't see themselves clear to give it to you. And I knew then in that moment, in that very defining moment that my grit had been misplaced, that I was fighting for something, trying to make it happen, and in the end found out I didn't deserve it. And it set me on a different path. It set me on a path of living a principled life, the life that I knew my mother would want me to live the life that I needed to live. And it was that principled life of character coupled with some tenacity and perseverance and passion and never losing the ability to dream, which I've never lost the ability to do. Knowing how to face triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, I knew he was right. And as I headed into high school, I knew I had some lessons to learn, lessons of humility, giving up the cockiness, just playing ball, just being a good student, just doing the right thing. <sighs> With no plan of any award, but just to be because it was right. And in May of my senior year, the Rotary Boy and Girl of the Year Award was about to be announced. And in most towns with a big Rotary Club, you have a Rotary Boy and Girl of the Month, and they come in for nine straight months. And then the last meeting of the Rotary Club in that given year is what they called Rotary Ann's Night. And on Rotary Ann's Night, they did this big banquet for over a thousand people with all the 18 boy and girls of the month and their parents and all the Rotary members and their wives and families and all the school officials, the whole county basically was there. As we got into the car to go, my mother said, you know, honey, you may get this. You know, my mom, if I get it, it's for you. I don't need it. And we sat down for the dinner. I can't believe I'm crying over this. <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of great things happen in my life, but just thinking back on this and sharing it with you brings me to tears, but Randy Hollis was still my best friend. And all the boys were on one side of the table and all the girl nominees were on the other side of the table. And they had announced the girl nominee and the girl winner who was a good friend of mine. And then as they were about to announce the boy, Randy looked over and he said, I think it's you. And it was. And in my remarks, I gave it to my mother and I thanked all my friends and I thanked the Rotary Club. And that night has meant so much to me for so many years. And I'm always interested all these 40 plus years later to see who the good citizens are in the middle school and who the Rotary boy and girl are at the high school. Because those moments were defining moments for me. They were the misuse of grit and they were the honest use of grit. To move forward into my life, coming to Ole Miss was the greatest four years of my life. I loved it with a passion. In the back of my mind, I always knew I wanted to go to Hollywood, but 
no one really wanted to listen. My father wanted me to be a doctor. He had come from a family of doctors and he was in the clothing business. And I was to make up for the fact that he didn't become a doctor. So I was supposed to be a doctor. After the second semester of my sophomore year, I decided I'm not doing this. And so I switched to theater and radio television communications and ended up graduating with a degree in theater and minors in radio television and chemistry. <laughs> but I finished in four years. I was taking almost 28 hours a semester to catch up because I had to get to Hollywood. And lo and behold, the summer I was supposed to go, Mary Donnelly Haskell wins Miss Mississippi. And I can't go. I've got to be here to be with her and go to Atlantic City when she competes for Miss America. And so it delayed my trip to California by a year. And when it was time to go, I was starting to get nervous. What am I doing? I know no one. What am I doing? And it was Mary who said, you have talked about this from the day I first met you. You're going and you're going to do it. So I went and I did it. And I worked for the most powerful talent agency in the world, the William Morris Agency. And I went from the mail room to the boardroom in just 10 years. And for the next 18 years, I ran the largest entertainment company in the world as the worldwide head of television and one of the six board members in charge of the operations of the company. I learned so much in those years. <laughs> you know, shows like Everybody Loves Raymond and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, A Different World, Murphy Brown, Lost. These were all shows that I was involved in being a part of the packaging team that sold them. And I became very good friends with all the actors and actresses and writers and directors. And when I decided I didn't wanna be an agent anymore, I used to tell people that if the phone rings after midnight or before 7 a.m., there's either been a death in the family or it's Kirstie Alley. She never slept. And she called me Sammy, which drove me crazy. Sammy, Sammy, I need to know, I need to know this project. I, I need to be submitted for this project. I want to play this part. I want to do this part. And um, <laughs> I loved all the people I worked with, but I was ready to do something new. Dolly Parton was one of my favorite clients. We've known each other almost 40 years. When I was a baby agent, because of my intense knowledge of Hollywood, which came as a result of booking, you know, I mean, shelving books at the Amory Municipal Library when I was in middle school to make 50 cents an hour. And by the way, if you want to add that up, I could make about $28 a month at 50 cents an hour for the hours that I had after school. But during my breaks there, I would read books on Hollywood. It took Photoplay Magazine way over the top in terms of my, my information about, about Hollywood. And I... I realized that in knowing this information, that I could use it once I got out there. And I became known as that kid from Mississippi who knows everything about the history of Hollywood. So when NBC bought the American Movie Awards from David Frost, and at that time in 1982, David Frost had just done the big interviews with Richard Nixon. Those Frost-Nixon interviews were, were hugely popular. And he was forming a television company. And he called the president of William Marsh and said, I want the agent who knows the most about old Hollywood to be my contact for the American Movie Awards. That was the kid from Mississippi. I came in and met with him, blew him away with my knowledge. He invited me to a production meeting the next day. And they announced that Hal B. Wallace was going to be named Lifetime Achievement Winner of the first American Movie Awards. You see, Dick Clark had done the first American Music Awards two years earlier, ripping off the Grammys. So NBC said, for ABC, so NBC said, well, we'll do the same thing with the Oscars. We'll do the American Movie Awards. So this was the first one. And I must say it created such a sensation, both positively and negatively, it was the last one, <laughs> but, but I was heavily involved in the first one. 
And once they told us in confidence that Hal B. Wallace was going to be named as the uh, Lifetime Achievement winner, they said, we want Betty Davis to give him the award. Who knows Betty Davis? Well, all I could hear in the room was mumble, mumble, mumble. Oh, she's so difficult. Oh, no one's seen her in years. Mumble, mumble, mumble. Well, who knows her agent, Marion Rosenberg? My hand goes up. Now, Sam, David said, do you really know Marion Rosenberg? Or are you just saying you know Marion Rosenberg? Well, she had her own agency and I did not know her. So I said, well, I don't know her, but I'll call her and I'll convince Miss Davis to come do this. Okay, you call her in the morning and call me after you talk to her. Well, I must have said all the right things because Marion Rosenberg said, okay, you've sold me. Now you need to sell Betty Davis. Here's her phone number. Give me five minutes to set you up and you call her. And I went, oh my God, dear Lord in heaven, please give me the right words to say, please, 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 please. And I call and her secretary, Catherine, puts me on hold. I'm still praying, please, 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 please. Mr. Haskell, this voice I knew all too well. This is Miss Betty Davis. What is it you would have me do? And how does it pertain to my old friend, Hal B. Wallace? Oh, Miss Davis, you know, he's, he's the guy that produced Jezebel for which you won your second Oscar. And, and he produced a lot of your other movies all during the forties. And, and I just want you to know on a personal level, I loved whatever happened to baby Jane. And she said, I hated Joan Crawford in that movie, but guess who got the Oscar nomination? Me, I drug her up and down the stairs and kicked her and fed her rats and I got the nomination. Well, the rest of the conversation must have gone very well because she said, all right, I'll do it on one condition. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you will pick me up in the limousine at precisely 7.30 p.m. You will take me directly to the green room and you will sit with me there until it's time for me to go on stage. Then you will walk me out to the edge of the stage. You will stop. You are not to go into the stage. I will go into the stage. I'll present Mr. Wallace the award. I'll come back, take your arm. You'll take me back to the green room, get my bag, put me back in the limo, and then you may go home. Yes, ma'am. The next day, front page of all the papers, Betty Davis and Hal Wallace together again. Betty Davis back in Hollywood. Betty Davis stuns the audience at the American Movie Awards. And the kid from Mississippi got a pat on the back. So you see, it was my grit that carried me through there. And it was my grit that I used successfully when I left William Morris and answered the call of my dear friend, Peter Roth at Warner Brothers to come talk to him about what I was doing. And I went to see him and he convinced me to enter an exclusive arrangement with Warner Brothers Television and produce TV for him. And I thought to myself, well, I certainly can't do it alone and I've gotta make sure I make Peter proud. So I started contacting former clients, telling them what I was doing. I get a call from Dolly Parton. She's heard I'm going to Warner Brothers. I want to go with you, she said. She gets in her bus in Nashville and she drives down here to Oxford. The bus can't get up our long driveway. So she had it parked over at, uh, which is the hotel love? Yeah, Champ Patel's, one of Champ Patel's hotels. And then we went and drove her and brought her up to the house. And we spent the entire weekend talking about what we might do together. And she was very, very anxious to do the story of her childhood, growing up in the Smoky Mountains, back in the woods. Now, I had been working at Warner Brothers about a year before Dolly came to see me that weekend. And because of my relationships, I had several pilot scripts that were offered to me, even produced a pilot. Um, and I found out very quickly that if I wanted to do drama, I was gonna be competing at a studio with the likes of J.J. Abrams and David E. Kelly and John Wells. And if only a couple of those shows were gonna be sold, I certainly 
was not going to be selected. It didn't matter how good my program was, I had no track record. So I had to have the grit to look at my situation. I had to have the grit to form a niche for myself. TV movies. TV movies were not on anyone's radar. And I went to Warner Brothers and said, Dolly and I want to do some television. Television movies? No, nobody does television movies. You can't do any television movies. Nobody will watch television movies. You know, I said, but we want to do the story of her as a little girl growing up in the Smoky Mountains. No, no one will do that. Until Peter Roth called me and said, I know you're facing a lot of negatives on this. But if you can go sell it yourself, I'll back you up. And so I did. And I called my friend Hudson Hickman, who's right down here, who had spent a career at MGM producing movies. And I said, I'm not doing this without you. We've been friends for over 40 years. And I said, I'm not doing this without you. And we hired a crew and we went to Atlanta and we found the, you know, the almost identical version of the Parton House and church and school. And we produced Code of Many Colors with Jennifer Nettles and darling Olivia Allen Lynn who played Dolly. And every step of the way, the network kept saying, I don't know about this. I, I don't know if anybody watched this. I, you know, it's going, to take, it's going to take a huge audience. You know, you're going to have to have several million people watch this or, or we can't do any more. You know, I, I'm just not sure this is going to work. Up until the day it was going to air that night, I was still getting these calls. And the next day, 16 million people had watched Code of Many Colors. 500,000 DVDs of that movie and its sequel Christmas of Many Colors, which was done the very next year because of the success of the first one. This all led to Netflix giving us a huge deal to produce eight movies under the banner Heartstrings. And that led to doing a huge original Christmas movie that Dolly wrote all the music for, starring Dolly and Christine Baranski and both my girls, Mary and Mary Lane were in it. And uh, Mary and Mary Lane were also part of the movies at Netflix as part of the Heartstrings banner. And I look back, I think if I hadn't had the grit to not take no for an answer, if Peter Roth hadn't had the grit to tell all his folks, leave him alone, let him go do what he believes he can do, none of that would have happened. None of it. I can tell you right now, none of it would have happened. And through the grit of that success, we've sold three more movies that are coming up over the next year that we're gonna be producing. I believe in myself and I believe in the goodness of the world and I believe in dreams. For without dreams, nothing can become reality. When my book, Promises I Made My Mother, was issued in the middle of 2009, I went to New York and did a whole press tour and I was on the Today Show and was asked the question at the end of what was supposed to be a three minute interview, turned out to be an eight minute interview. But I was asked the question at the end, what do you want people to take from this book? The book was entitled Promises I Made My Mother. And a lot of the stories that I've shared with you today are in that book. But I said, I hope that people will think about their mothers and will think about what their mothers taught them. And then I want them to pick up the phone and call their mothers and thank them specifically for what they did for them. And if like me, you have to look heavenward to thank her, then you do that too. And then you make some promises of your own. Now, one of the things I like to do when I'm in this kind of situation 
is to have questions and answers. So I hope that you've all <laughs> listened very carefully because I would love to take your questions because in your questions, I'll be reminded of a lot more stories. So don't be shy. Anything is fair. Ask whatever you want to ask. I'm an open book. Oh, come on. Don't be shy. Yes. You mean to get restarted all those years ago? One of the things that I tell young people is the most important thing they can have in their lives other than someone who loves them better than anything is to have relationships. And my relationships, when I sat in a chair of power at the William Morris Agency, and fortunately I think my mother would be proud that I had primary and secondary power as I sat in that chair, allowed me to re-enter that world with those same relationships intact. Most of the people that we've worked with have been friends, friends who want to be in my sphere. And if there were new people that were brought into the circle, they too became friends. And I will continue using all of them as we move forward. Relationships are pure gold if they're real and you look at them with the right formula of grit and then maintain them. You know, I think that it's very important for us to know what it is that we want and to be able to look in the mirror and say, do I like the person I see? And if you like that person, you have to say, okay, how do I maintain that person? And it's the maintenance of self. It's the maintenance of that person looking back in the mirror that allows you to be successful and allows that relationship to stay strong. And it was all about relationships. Thank you, Liz. Come on, come on. Yes, in the back. Thank you, Jeff. Well, it's, it's all driven by faith, a lot of prayer, seeking understanding, Mary Haskell, <laughs> you know, when I use that expression, facing triumph and disaster, and not letting either of those imposters control who you are, I think it's finding in the mirror the person you know yourself to be, living the life that you know you're supposed to live and proving the naysayers wrong. And there are many cases where people are attacked in corporate America, some for the right reasons, but then there are some who are attacked for the wrong reasons. And you have to live a life 
that people will admire. And if people admire you, even in the darker times, they will come forward and stand with you. And never has it proven more positively than being here in Oxford, Mississippi and having everyone stand with me, being in Hollywood and having everyone there stand with me. We know who you are. We love you. Let that go. And there are varying degrees of attacks and challenges and compromises that we all face every day. So-and-so said so-and-so about you. And my answer is, well, you know that's not true. Did you defend me? And they go, ah, 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 ah. you know, they just can't wait to tell you something bad that someone has said about you. But if you can maintain who you are in decency and integrity and stand in the light of God's grace every day, you will come out the victor every time. And it's God. And my mother used to say, you can pray to God in the shower, in the car, wherever you are, but when you're on your knees, I believe he hears you best. You know, I have this kind of funny little thing that I say that when it comes time to go to heaven, that I may end up at the pearly gates and talking to St. Peter and he's gonna have his list and he's gonna be going down the list. I'm sorry, Mr. Haskell, but I, I don't see your name. That's impossible. Look again. I'm sorry, Mr. Haskell. Well, I said, well, do you see that blonde sitting up there by God? That's Mary. You tell her I'm out here. She'll make him let me in. And I truly, truly believe that because she is an angel. And I'm the luckiest man in the world to have her. My, my mother loved her so much and our entire family does. In fact, <laughs> I have an aunt who once said, if every member of our family was given a 24 hour edict to move your entire family and all your belongings to Russia, Mary Haskell is the only one who would make the plane. <laughs> and I, I believe, I believe that. So thank you for your question. Next question. Hudson. Yep. Ruth Engelhart was the head of the business affairs department at William Morris. And when I first got to California, I didn't know so. So I started calling the William Morris agency because I wanted an interview and no one would answer. And I was at the time enrolled in law school at Southwestern Law School, downtown Los Angeles, because I thought, well, maybe I should just become an attorney and I'd taken the LSATs really quickly and gotten admitted at the very last minute. And I hated it. And I needed something to give me the strength to stay with it. So I went and looked up all the famous alumni that had graduated from there. And one of the top names on the list was Ruth Engelhart at the William Morris Agency. So I called her up. Her secretary laughed. She's not going to talk to you. I called the next day. She laughed. I called and called and called and called and called. And on Labor Day, the Friday before Labor Day, 1978, she answers her own phone because everyone had gone home early. And she immediately said, I want to see the face that goes with this accent. And I drove to Beverly Hills and went and spent three hours with Ruth Engelhart. And she convinced me to withdraw from law school. I could still get my money back and to start in the mail room for $125 a week. My father thought I was insane, but I knew it was the beginning of that dream coming true. Another moment that happened, and somebody wave at me if I'm going on too long. Liz, where's Liz? We okay? Was we put together the first network airing of the Golden Globe Awards. And of course, it's on this Sunday night on NBC and has been for years. 
But at the time I was a young agent at William Morris, it was in syndication. And um, <laughs> we had gotten it on CBS for the very first time. And it was very important that it be a well-produced show. And it was the year that Dolly Parton and Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin had done nine to five. And Dolly Parton was nominated for best song for nine to five. And I knew that she was gonna be there to rehearse. So I got there extra early. And I walked into the Beverly Hilton Hotel where they do the show every year. And she was there earlier than I was. And because it was about an hour before it was to start, I went up to the table and I said, uh, Miss Parton, yes, having no idea who I was. My name is Sam Haskell and I'm from the William Morris Agency and we represent the show. Yes. And I'm originally from Mississippi. And she went, oh. I said, and I went to Ole Miss and Ole Miss, that's my husband's favorite football team. Sit down here and talk to me. And we had a 30 minute conversation that began a 40 year friendship. It took me about 10 more years to convince her management to let me represent her. But after I did, we were fast friends and great business partners. And I'm proud to say that when Peter Roth at Warner Brothers told me to build a sandbox and invite my friends in to play, Dolly was the first friend I invited to come into that sandbox. And we've had enormous success together. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of what we've done and so proud of the grit that it took to make it all happen. And I want you to know that through 11 movies, and Hudson can verify this, we came in under budget and on time. And that creates a great reputation for us. And it will allow us to do many, many more projects. So thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have three brand new series, two of which are based on Warner Brothers IP that I wanna turn into successful series. And Warner Brothers Television is behind me in this. And I hope that a year from now, I'm able to tell you exactly what they are, but it's under lock and key right now. But I have three potential hit series that could go on the air by the beginning of 22. And um, I'm so excited about that. And that's, that's the current dream. Yes, sir, in the back. <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't have any money, so I couldn't hang out anywhere. So, uh, but I, I lived in a little tiny apartment. And in that apartment building were several people from Mississippi. And we ended up calling it the Dixie Arms. It was in Hollywood, in the heart of Hollywood, on a street called Camino Palmero. And I had a little single apartment and a hot plate. And I lived there for a year. And because I was only making $125 a week at the mailroom, I went to work at Universal Studios on the tour on the weekends. And I made an extra $200 a week out at the, out at the tour at the, at the studio. And so, I had more money than I thought I'd ever have in my life, you know, and, and did that for an entire year, but it almost took me out. <laughs> and I had to have some weekends off. So I only did that for a year, but I lived in Camino Palmero. And by 82, a, you know, Mary and I had gotten married. Um, and uh, then we started our progression of homes that we would buy and sell and move up and buy and sell and move up but that's where I was when I first got there. Do you guys mind if I just take this microphone and sit down? I am soaking wet. <laughs> it is so, I don't know if everybody else is hot, but do we know if there's a chair that I could sit on up here? Perfect. We'll stay as long as you like. Thank you. Okay. In the back. Was there another one in the back? Oh, here, Elizabeth. Um, 
<laughs> that. Well, Mary Haskell's chicken spaghetti recipe is top secret because it's what she uses to not only entertain in our home, but it's also, what do you call it? The grieving, sick and bereavement gift that she takes when someone is sick or bereaving. And it's a top secret. And, or if she's feeding the scholars, but I'm afraid I can't tell you what the ingredients are except for chicken and spaghetti. <laughs> Next question. Yes, ma'am. My 18 year old self to not put anything in an email that you don't want to see on the cover of the New York Times. That's what I would tell my, my, my 18 year old self. Next question. Yes, sir. The question is, during my plotting of my course and what I wanted to do, did I ever have a plan B? So here's the answer to that question. I never had a plan B until I had so many wonderful things happening that I needed to know that if this doesn't happen, then I could easily do this or I could easily do that. In the beginning, in college and in the first years after college, I never had a plan B because I was always planning what had to be. And I'm very, very fortunate in my journey that I have been able to make most of what my dreams have dictated come true. And I, I love life. I love challenges. I love turning no into yes. And that's another way to use the word grit is turning a no into a yes, because we're not told yes every single time. We, we all know that we're told no more than we're told yes, but I believe so strongly in turning no into yes if I'm passionate about it. And that word passion is on the cover of Duckworth's book, passion and perseverance. And perseverance is so much a part of my life and I just never give up and I never stop trying. Um, and Dolly wrote a song called Try that we ended up putting into our big musical on Netflix, which got critical acclaim. And I hope all of you were able to see it. If you haven't, then you need to go home tonight and watch it. You can pull it up on Netflix. But the lyrics of the song are, try to be the first one up the mountain. Try to be the first to touch the sky. Don't let somebody tell you, you can't do it. All you have to do is try. And I so believe that. And the first time I heard the song, I just cried like a baby because it's my story. I've always tried. I've never given up. In the face of adversity, I never give up. I either fall on my knees and pray, or I, I, I think about the positive things that I can make, that I can make happen. And my mother believed that to those whom much is given, as the Bible taught her, much is required. And um, in my plan, I always included giving back. And if I can become successful, I'm going to help. And in my mother's memory, I established that Mary Kirkpatrick Haskell Scholarship Foundation in my hometown of Amory. And for 14 years, we put on star-studded concerts there on my high school football field where I played ball. And we raised over $4 million to send deserving kids in Mississippi to college, all in my mother's memory. And that was always part of the plan. I wasn't quite sure that it would be a scholarship foundation in her memory. Of course, I was only 30 when she died and she's been gone for 35 years. And um, I had her for 30 wonderful years. And 
when my success started happening, I knew that I had to figure out a way to stop mourning her death and start celebrating her life. And it took a lot of grit from me and a lot of grit from people in Avery, Mississippi to help me put together a scholarship foundation with over 400 volunteers who produced these huge shows that made it all the way to the New York Times. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of success with that. And I'm so grateful to many of my friends in Hollywood for being so generous. You know, there's a, a line in a Kevin Costner movie, if you build it, they will come. And somehow I felt like if I can build something that people will respond to, they'll come and they'll give the best that they have. One of my mother's favorite stories that she used to read to me and my brothers was Stone Soup. And it was about three Revolutionary War soldiers who were coming back from the battles on the East Coast with the British troops. Uh, the colonists had won and these three men were trying to get home and they had no food and they stopped in a little village and they saw an old kettle on the side of the road and they built a tripod and put that kettle on the tripod and put some water in it and built a little fire and started boiling the water. And then another one went and found a stone, a big rock, dropped it in the pot and they just stood there stirring that rock, stirring and stirring. One by one, the villagers who had all closed up in their homes and closed their shutters, they were afraid. They didn't know if these were, you know, loyalists or who, they didn't know who they were. They opened up and came out, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're making stone soup. Well, what is stone soup? And they said, well, you'll see. And they looked in, well, that's just a rock. I've got a piece of chicken. Maybe we can put that in there. And then somebody came out with a handful of beans and a piece of corn. And before you know it, they were cooking up a stew that fed the entire town, all starting from that one little stone. So I have likened my philanthropy to stone soup because I believe it's not just about me, it's about all of you. And if I can bring you all to the pot and have each one of you through your own grit put the best you have in that pot, we can stir up goodness that can be shared with the world. And I believe that to my very core because goodness will always prevail. Goodness will come out on top every time. And it's been proven to me and I've seen it happen in the lives of others. Goodness will always prevail. And the consistency of goodness. You know, I, I believe so strongly in thinking about what we want, then thinking about who's going to help me get it, and then making me happy to give it to me, or me making them happy for me to give it to them. And so when I think of philanthropy and making a plan for philanthropy that goes along with my, my plan for my life, if I can make people happy to come to that pot and put the best they have into it, look what we can do. And I call that philosophy thoughtfully political. In fact, in my book, I have a whole chapter about what it is to be thoughtfully political, but it works and goodness works and perseverance works and passion works and dreams work. So I know it's long-winded, but I hope it answers your question. <laughs> Who else? Oh, thank you, Suzanne. I don't know why I'm so hot. Is it hot to you guys? Much better, thank you, Suzanne. Next question, don't be shy. You know something else I would tell my 18 year old self? I like that question a lot. And I was just being kind of funny there with my answer, but you know, I, I do have another answer to that question. I would tell myself to just believe that it will happen to just believe that if I'm prepared, it will happen. It doesn't mean not to work hard. It doesn't mean not to, to dream and push and push and push, but to just take a breath and believe. I've always been in a hurry and I wish that I could slow down, but even at 65, I'm still in a hurry. 
I'm in a hurry to, to get my movie in Canada made. I'm in a hurry to get these series sold. I, I have so much that I want to do, and I, I don't take any day for granted, and I never stop. I never stop. And if I were 18 again, I would say, it's okay to stop every now and then. It's really okay to stop, take a breath, and learn how to play golf better. You know, my father was an avid golfer, and he would take me and my brothers to the golf course every weekend. I never wanted to play. I, I was a good caddy, and I knew what clubs he would want at any given place his ball was, you know, had, had been shot to. And I, I knew what he wanted, but I didn't really want to play. I thought, golf, golf. I've got, he said, but this is going to be a great man's game. When you're an older man, this is what you need to do is to play golf. And, and, and you know, I'm who I am. And I regret it every day that I can't go to a golf course and shoot 100 with no effort. And if I had learned as a kid, I would be able to do that. And I would be satisfied with that. I wouldn't have to go every day and, and scream and yell every time I hit a bad ball. I would be happy to just shoot 100. And as an agent, all my clients play golf. And it was too embarrassing for me not to be with them. And I'd have the grit to use that word again, to go play anyway. And thank heavens, most of the tournaments that I was in were best ball. And I could hit a good drive every now and then, a great putt every now and then. So I could sort of cover up the fact that I was no good by playing best ball in a scramble. But I really wish I'd learned to play golf as a kid. So that I would tell my 18 year old self that too. Yes, ma'am. I've had many mentors and the earliest ones were at the William Morris Agency. Um, really quite famous agents, a man named Norman Brokaw, um, who just died at 93 a couple years ago and his widow asked me to speak at his funeral and the entire population of Hollywood was at this funeral. And um, Marlo Thomas, who you know through your work at St. Jude's, introduced me and I, I just spoke from the heart and she had tears in her eyes when she came back up and thanked me for, for what I'd said, but I loved him so much and he was so good to me and he, he loved me and he, he embraced the difference that I brought to the table. And then there was another man named Tony Fantosi who was this Italian agent from Chicago and um, he talked like this, Tony Fantosi at Haskell, you got to get your butt down here. I got something for you to do. And he was one of the most important agents at the company, but he believed in me and he gave me so many opportunities. Then there was a man named Jerry Katzman, who was also very good to me, who was the head of the television department before I was head of the television department. And he put me on a path that, that allowed me to become a really great leader. And, you know, I said earlier in the speech today that um, I've always kind of felt special. I've always known I have a presence, but sometimes you need guidance on how to funnel that specialness or funnel that presence. And Jerry Katzman helped mold that into me and um, rewarded me for it. And then I had a mentor at NBC named Brandon Tarnikoff. And I had met him as a young agent at a special called the NBC Family Christmas, which NBC and William Morris put together through our client, Robert Precht, who was Ed Sullivan's son-in-law. Robert Precht married Ed Sullivan's only daughter. In fact, the Prechts gave Mary and me our Hollywood wedding shower. And um, I love the Prechts and I love their children and we were all sort of the same age. And, these were the grandchildren of the great Ed Sullivan. And so I really admired Bob Precht and we'd put together this wonderful cross promotional show of NBC stars singing Christmas songs and performing in this big two hour special. So at that particular time, you had the cast of Cheers and the cast of St. Elsewhere or Nell Carter and Give Me a Break. And they were all singing and dancing. Debbie Allen, who was my client, Debbie's been my friend and or client for 40 years. She was on fame at the time. And so I was at the taping 
that took place over an entire weekend before it aired the next week on NBC. And Brandon Tartikoff was this young 28 year old president of the network, the youngest president of any network in history. And he and I hung out together and he liked me. And he called that man, Jerry Katzman, who I just mentioned to you. And he said, I like this Haskell kid. I want him to be assigned to me. And so at 25 years of age, I became the packaging agent for NBC because the young president wanted to talk to Sam. That mentorship, that relationship, and by the way, it took a lot of grit dealing with the fallout at the agency for the people who thought they should have gotten it. But Jerry somehow knew that I was ready and Brandon certainly wanted me. And I want you to know for the, the many years that I serviced NBC, there was not a season that we did not sell a show. Not a single season that I did not sell him a show. And I look back and I think Brandon Tartikoff is just one of the greatest mentors I could have had. So, who else? Tony Fantosi would say, get your hands up. Ask the Goyam a question. Oh, I was the token Gentile in the William Morris Agency too. You know, it was like 95% Jewish, but I can, I can carry on with the best of them. Who else? Any more online? No? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sis. I try. I try. And I want you to know that one of one of your old Miss scholars, Bobby Kelly, works for me in California. And um, Bobby got his start right here. Um, I became his mentor through his relationship with Mary. And he is just doing a fantastic job. And Dolly loves him. Everybody loves him. He and uh, he's the director of development. He and my VP of development, Billy Levin, are just my right and my left hands. And and I love them both, but you would all be very proud of your Ole Miss Women Scholar, Bobby Kelly, and what he's doing for Magnolia Hill Productions in California. Thanks for that reminder. Yes, sir. The biggest surprise in my life or in the entertainment business or? Ah, oh, what a good question. Do you know that I have been speaking to crowds for 30 years? And no one has ever asked me that question. So let me just think on that for a second. The biggest surprise. Okay. This is one of the biggest surprises. When Code of Many Colors was released on NBC to rave reviews and huge ratings, I was absolutely sure that it was going to be nominated for the Emmy. I was so sure that it was going to be nominated for the Emmy that I scheduled the first day of production for the sequel on the day the Emmy nominations were coming out because all kinds of press was in Atlanta with us for the first day of production on the sequel. Dolly was there and I thought, well, we'll just go live to Dolly as we accept the nomination news. And so I have everybody sitting there. I've got the entire crew, every NBC reporters, everybody there, and we weren't nominated. And I had to go on through my devastation and get everybody back doing what they were supposed to be doing and every, all, all the shots go back to where we were. Nobody can be in here, you know, and I had to tell Dolly we weren't nominated. I was so sure. So we finished the sequel. It airs to the same ratings and the same numbers, but I had worked so hard. I went to every Emmy party, every bit of work that I could do to get that Emmy nomination and we didn't get it. So the next year, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I thought if they're not gonna nominate Code of Colors, they'll never nominate anything. And the morning of the nominations, I was on a conference call 
And I hear all this hubbub in my outer office there on the Warner Brothers lot. And I hear people clapping and screaming and I hang up the phone, they come running in, you're nominated. And I went, for what? And they said, Christmas of many colors. I went, what? And I get on the phone and I call Dolly. I said, Dolly, we're nominated. She goes, for what? And I go, Christmas of many colors. So I think that could be one of the biggest surprises <laughs> because I truly, honest to God, did not expect it. Yes. Okay. Okay, read that. Read that one more time. What is... Of me personally? Oh, what, is, what do I give credit to for the longevity of my business? Okay, that's the question. I am a very creative person. I, as I said earlier, I've watched television since I was a little kid. I think I know what people like. I have not, I've done enough good and bad pilots to know what people respond to. I've had wonderful series on the air. I've had series that have been canceled. But now that I can choose my own programming, I believe it's because I'm good at it. And I don't mean for that to be cocky. I don't mean for that to sound prideful because I'm not a prideful person. But I do believe that my ability to identify material, and I must say that one of the brand new series that I'm working on comes from a set of New York Times bestselling books. And Mary Lane Haskell is the one that found those books and uh, brought them to me. And um, I've read all nine of them during this damn pandemic. And now Warner Brothers is so excited and we're about to take it out and sell it. And I have these wonderful English writers um, who are passionate about it. And um, I hope that a year from now, you'll, you'll know all about this very secret, but wonderful, wonderful, incredible series. And I believe that the longevity is also based on the fact that I never give up. I've got good taste and I never give up. And that goes to that word perseverance that Ms. Duckworth writes about. That was from who? Oh, tell Paul Lindsay hello. Hello, Paul Lindsay. He was our one of our assistant directors on our Heartstrings movies and our big musical. Anyone else? Well, if not, I thank you so much for coming and being a part of this with me today. I have loved being with you. And the thing I'd like to leave you with is this. Always be kind. You never know what someone could be going through. Always be kind. Thank you.